Ronalda Church, and thank you for joining us today. Please take a minute to fill out our online connect card with your mobile device or computer and let us know you're here. And please tell us how we can pray for you and support you right now. This information goes a long way in helping us work together and pray together as a church family. Well, we are moving headlong into 2021 and have a lot going on across our campuses. You can stay in the loop by visiting ronaldachurch.org. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our weekly newsletter so that you get updates sent right to your inbox. We invite you to give as a part of your worship today. Your giving enables us to provide resources needed to grow our current ministries, bless our community, and increase our role in sharing the gospel both here and around the world. You can give securely online at ronaldachurch.org slash give. You may be facing challenges that are overwhelming, and we really want to help. As a church, we're a group of people with talents, resources, and time that are ready to serve the kingdom by helping each other in times of need. Let us know on your Connect card right now. You can call us day or night using the info on your screen as well. That was really good. There was a little glitch. Thanks again for joining us today. Wherever you are, welcome. Let's worship together. Welcome, everybody, to the online service of Renolda Church. We're glad you're joining us. We're going to start by reading Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Lord, help us walk in your life. Teach us your ways. Help us to bear fruit. We pray that this morning in your name. Springtime with you, making all things new. Your light is breaking through the dark. This love, it is sweeter than wine, bringing joy, bringing life. Your hope is rising like the dawn. Whoa. It's always like springtime with you, making all things new. Your light is breaking through the dark. This love it is sweeter than wine, bringing joy, bringing life. Your hope is rising like the dawn. Whoa. This is what you do, this is what you do, you make me come alive, this is what you do, this is what you do, you make me come alive, this is what you do, this is what you do.
alive This is what you do, this is what you do You make me come alive This is what you do, this is what you do Oh 
time and eternity forever. Welcome again to Worship Online with Renolda Church. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be in your home if you're worshiping as an individual or gathered as a family or with friends or whether it's just sometime during the week, it is a, a great joy to know that we're connected with you and that we're able to help build you up in the Spirit. We'd love to hear from you, of course, and there's a Connect card that you can fill out and tell us how we can pray for you and tell us how we can celebrate with you as well. And it's very easy to make your uh, donations online, your partnership financially, uh, online um, is imperative for us to stay strong in this ministry. And I want to say personally, thank you, thank you, thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Uh, you can always, of course, uh, send checks into the church. The office is open five days a week. Um, or just take the extra step and set up a recurring giving that helps build the kingdom of God. Thank you very much. I hope that we can stay in touch with you. As we get ready to pray, I want to take a moment and thank God for the life and legacy of Elder Bill Rice, who uh, went to his heavenly home uh, this weekend after a brief illness. And uh, Bill was uh, one of the finest elders and the greatest uh, lovers of Scripture and most profound and gentle uh, men of God, man of God that I've ever known. And I counted him amongst my dearest friends of the last 24 years. Uh, we shall sorely miss this brother who was a tower of faith in our midst and an absolute delight. May uh, he enjoy the splendors of the kingdom as he sees Jesus face to face. Let's pray together as we receive our offering. Father, thank you for your incredible love that has been poured out in our hearts by faith through the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Father, during these difficult days, pray for Bill's family and other families right now that are grieving, and many, Lord, uh, who are facing adversity during this pandemic, and many who have been troubled in the midst of political unrest and every form of malicious talk. And we pray, Father, that you would do a great work of spiritual awakening in these difficult days. We're praying, Father, for protection of life and health. And we're praying, Father, for the elevation of the gospel. And that out of what seems like the ruins of this past year, that you will elevate Christ to a new place, not only in our lives, but across the globe. So take what we give and use it for your good, for the good of the people everywhere, and for your own glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, ladies. My name is Ashley Johnson, and I serve as the Director of Women's Ministry here at Rinalda Church. Listen, if I'm honest, I'm a bit tired, and I've heard from many of you that you are as well. Navigating life in this pandemic has been exhausting in lots of ways, and we want to provide an opportunity for you to receive nourishment, nourishment relationally, nourishment spiritually, and we would love to do so as we prepare for the most triumphant day in the Christian calendar for Easter morning. We are offering nourish groups. They're short. They're only five weeks long. They're accompanied by just a four week simple plan that will help you dive into the word of God and receive nourishment from him. We're gonna walk through the book of Mark. We're gonna look closely at the life of Jesus, at his death and at his resurrection. And we're gonna enjoy one another as we do so. These groups will be fun and they'll be brief and they'll be life-giving. So would you join us? I would love for you to sign up for a nourish group you can do so either online or in person you just copy the link and put it in your browser or if you're in person with us just indicate on your connect card that you'd like to be a part of one of these groups in the month of march i can't wait to grow along with you and be filled up by the word of god and fellowship
What if being a Christian was less about what I can do for God and more about what God has done for me? What if my purpose and identity weren't built around the things I can produce, but the things I've received? What if God's promise is true, and I already have every spiritual blessing? What if we live as His children? What if we live as His royal heirs? From now on. Now on. What a blessing it is to be with you, everyone at our campuses, uh, everybody in King. God bless you uh, all, and I'm so happy to be with you, as well as those of you that are joining us at our campus in Clemens those that are at Union Cross Campus, welcome. And to everyone who's joining us online, what a great honor to present the gospel uh, again today. Are you ready for some good news? Yesterday's rubble makes for tomorrow's building supplies. This is Jeremiah 30, 18. This is what the Lord says, the city will be rebuilt on her ruins. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins. We're in a new series. I've called it From Now On. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live your life from now on? Instead of dwelling on the past or dragging the baggage of the past with you to be able to just live from this moment forward. It's rooted in our New Year's blessing this year. May God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh, a mysterious blessing that uh, is absolutely powerful once you begin to understand its gospel symbolism, the subject of my new book. I'm so excited about coming out this week. And that part of the blessing, may God make you as Manasseh, because Manasseh means forgotten all my troubles. It was Joseph's firstborn son. And Joseph had faced so many troubles. But when his, when his, his life had been redeemed by God, he'd been put into a position of such leadership in Egypt, and now God had given him a son, and he's named him Manasseh. He said, it's as if I've forgotten all my troubles. Well, he hadn't literally forgotten his troubles, but he was able to live from now on. He's able to live knowing that I'm actually at a higher place because of what my brothers meant for evil in my life. And so that's what we're learning about. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful to live like that? And today I want to explore the part of living from now on that is what do you do with all the ruins of your life, all of the mistakes, all of the trauma, all the baggage, all the stuff that didn't work out, all the stuff that you messed up or somebody else messed up because they afflicted it against you, or just things that didn't work out in life, difficult things. All of it leaves, in a sense, figuratively, this rubble in our lives. And what do we do with all of that, all that mess? And we come today to this prophetic text from Jeremiah who is prophesying to the people of God who have been in exile in Babylon, away from their homeland, and God has a plan to restore them back to their homeland. And these restoration promises become spiritually powerful for us. So here is today's text, Jeremiah 30, verse 18. I'm reading from the New International Version because I think it is particularly beautiful. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and have compassion on his dwellings. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. This is what the Lord says. I will restore. That's who God is. He's a restorer. You know, there are two television uh, network stations that I, I could have never, ever imagined would have become big hits. Um, I wouldn't even thought they'd been able to stay on the air. The first was when the Weather Channel came out. Some of you remember when the Weather Channel first emerged. I was like, who is going to watch the Weather Channel? 
I mean, the weather, you find out in 30 seconds what the weather forecast is for the next day. Who would have known that we would just be mesmerized by sitting around and watching the weather 24 hours a day? But the other one, what I would have never imagined was HGTV, Home and Garden TV. I mean, there are times in my home I thought yeah, it would have been better off if that had never existed. And my wife loves uh, HGTV. My daughter loves HGTV. Uh, all mainly centered around reality shows of people that fix up old houses or fix up their house and decide whether they're going to sell it or whether they're going to stay in it. And Chip and Joanna Gaines, who I do love because uh, they're Baylor people. My son went to Baylor. They're out in Waco, Texas. Gave a real name to Waco. Fixer Upper, where they just go into a house and envision it being totally different and taking all of that exists and making it better until there's just a big reveal moment and the people get to come and see their house and that's been completely remade. And people just love it. I read, as I was looking this up this week, that the HGTV network is the third most watched channel after Fox News and ESPN, HGTV and Fixer Upper. It just, I mean, why do people love to see somebody else get their house fixed up? Isn't that kind of weird? I think it's because down deep in our souls, all of us in some way have this deep, innate longing for nothing to get scrapped, but for everything to get remade. That there's something within us that just loves it when there's a big renovation project because we're made for it. There's a big renovation project going on in London right now, the Buckingham Palace. <laughs> the palace itself is, of course, uh, uh, home of the Queen and the royal family. And uh, I understand it's going through a half million dollar renovation project. Uh, they say all the wiring, all the pipes, they're all old. They got to be replaced. They're taking out all the art. They're taking everything out. They're redoing it. They're painting everything. They're going to spend a half million dollars on it. Uh, you know, what's interesting is that when uh, the subject of how old and needy the Buckingham Palace is, one thing for sure nobody said was, hey, it's just too expensive. Let's just get rid of the thing and build some new shiny palace somewhere where they can live. Nobody's saying that about the Buckingham Palace. Why? Because it's the Buckingham Palace. Because it's, 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 it's got a value that is not just in its bricks and mortar and all of its ornate beauty. It's got a value because of the history, because of what it is, because it's, it's the Buckingham Palace. It is the, it is the place of inhabitation for the royal family. The reason I bring that up is I want you today to get this beautiful prophetic picture for your life. That God has made a promise through Jeremiah, not just to the exiles in Babylon, but to you, to me. Your city, your life, your destiny, your sense of being, your, your city, you, you, like the city, will be rebuilt upon a ruins. And, it, and if you would never think of tearing down and just and just annihilating the Buckingham Palace, I want you to be assured that God isn't going to let your life be thrown away either. But instead, He is the master renovator. He is the restorer. And I want to show you today what it means to say the city will be rebuilt on her ruins. And I want you to be reacquainted with the God who is the restorer, who one day will make a new heaven and earth, not by annihilating this heaven and this earth, but by remaking, building it afresh out of the same raw materials. That's who God is. So here's the, here's the text again, Jeremiah 30, 18. This is what the Lord says, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents. Tents is a, is a, a symbolic way of 
referring to the people of God, to their, and have compassion on his dwellings, to have mercy on, on the people by relocating them. And the city will be rebuilt on her ruins. Now that phrase, the city will be rebuilt on her ruins, is a description of, in Hebrew, what is called a tell. And you can see this word spelled T-E-L or T-E-L-L. A tell is essentially a, a big mound um, that gets formed over time. And, and, and essentially, here's, here's what happens. Here's what happens. So uh, and if you'll imagine this little process with me, our cartoons we have here. So there's a small city, and maybe there is a marauding army, an enemy, that comes, or maybe there's a natural calamity, a fire or a storm, and it's, it is leveled. It is put into ruins. And what happens, especially in the Middle Eastern world, is that over time, all that rubble and all those ruins, they are slowly filled in by the sediment and the sand that blows. You can just imagine after years of the wind blowing over all the rocks and the, and the, the mud bricks and all of the, the rubble from that former city, that, uh, that eventually it just fills in, you see. And it becomes part of, of a new, like a mound that is there. Well, people who come by later go, well, here is a more elevated building site that would make a suitable place for building again. And so they come back and they build again on top of it. And imagine that same process. A marauding army comes, a calamity comes, and the city gets leveled again. Rubble upon rubble, and the winds of time blow, and sediment and sand, and it slowly fills it in again until now the hill is even bigger. And so now you have an elevated spot, and some future people come and say, here's a perfect place to build a new city, and up goes the city. And, and they love to study these because all the layers of civilization that are seen there and these, there are thousands of tells across uh, the Middle East. Um, here is uh, an example of Tel Bari in northeastern Syria. Um, a small tell, which is particularly beautiful, the citadel of Aleppo, which has been occupied since the third millennium and, uh, B.C. And, and the most maybe famous tell is Tel Megiddo. This is known from the Bible because in Hebrew it's called the Mount of Megiddo or Har Megiddo. Um, the archaeological site is really special there because it hadn't really been disturbed since the 5th century B.C. Har Megiddo or Armageddon that looks out over the valley of Jezreel that you read about in the book of Revelation. So what would happen is that people would come and they would build on these tells the city gets rebuilt on its original ruins. And it seems counterintuitive at first to think that you'd build on top of where there were ruins, but once you understand how over time it all has formed this elevated place, it becomes a perfect building plot. And I was, I was one website uh, was describing the tell and, and listed a number of reasons why people would build on these tells. And I thought, how 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 spiritually significant each one of these points. So first was that under the ruins of the city that had been broken down, all the building blocks were available. So they, they could excavate and recapture the heaviest blocks that had, had not been destroyed but could be recaptured, and now they didn't have to do the hard work, because this is one of the hardest things in building a city or the city walls, was to get those really heavy stones, the huge building blocks that had to be transported over a long distance. And that was, that was a, a big expense and a big labor. And when they come to a tell, those big building blocks were already there. And I just want to say that I think God wants you to know 
that though you may not feel it or see it right now, that in the rubble of your life, there's some big building blocks that are already there. Just because some difficult things have happened in your past doesn't mean that they're not raw material there that God's going to use now. There might be some of the worst mistakes of your life or even some of the trauma of your life, things that really the enemy has wrought against you that have left your soul feeling like it's just in ruins over it that actually are huge building blocks that are going to be foundational to what God is going to do next from now on. Foundational. It's already there. The second thing I read about tells and why people build on the tells is that the waterworks were still available or the city was originally built near a stream or a river because that was so imperative to have any sort of thriving city is you had to be able to channel water into your city. There's either a spring and some sort of waterworks that have been crafted or a river that's nearby, and the better cities had found ways to channel that into their city and work it. And people like to build on the tells because even though there was a mound of ruins, they could excavate it and they could find the, the sources of water that were ancient. God likes to rebuild on the rubble of our lives because even though we have experienced the pain of life, the river of life is still running through us. Anyone who is in Christ has a river of life, abundant life, like springing up on the inside. And God still has His Holy Spirit at work in you even when life is difficult. A third reason that they like to build on tells is that a new city would require a lot of heavy financial investment. And sometimes it just wasn't possible financially for a people to go and start totally afresh. In other words, there was value in that tell. And people that would build on it would, would redeem its value, whatever they could use of the materials there. Beloved, you and your life, no matter how much it's been broken or hurt, are of infinite value in God's eyes, and what looks like ruins to you is of great worth to God, and there is building material in your life that you may not be aware of, but God is, and God wants to rebuild the city on its ruins. A fourth reason that they would like to, to build on tells is that the old city was usually built on prime in a prime location. There was a reason somebody built the city there in the first place. It was something about that city that was set there. And so there really is no better location, no real sense to go try to relocate somewhere else because here this hill, this tell has been built in the location that made sense anyway. I see something prophetic in that for us that is encouraging. Sometimes when life's been hard, when you have rubble in your past, there's this idea that I just got to get away from it all. But I think sometimes God says, no, you are still in the right place. You're still the right person. And I don't need somewhere else or somebody else. I'm going to do it through you. And whatever's happened in your life doesn't mean that you've been rendered unimportant. No, this is the still the strategic location. You still are God's strategic location. Yes, you are. You still have the plan for your life. Another reason they like to go build on these tells is that the walls of these cities were built to last. And, and, and that, that, as I was saying about the heavy building blocks, there, there, were, there were parts of that city wall that could be recaptured and could be built on. So the, the foundational protective wall was easier to rebuild on, 
on those houses. And, and related to that, the houses themselves were usually made of mud bricks, which they, unlike thick rock, would disintegrate over time and essentially would be, become workable clay again. So those bricks that once were bricks then become clay and they become, they become adaptable in the, in the potter's hands. And some of your life, you know, I mean, you know what, when, you, when you've been through the difficult things, some of it, you feel like, you know, that part of me turned to dust and has gone back into clay. And God, God can remold that. God, so there are parts of your life that are foundational and they're building blocks, and God can use that to rebuild foundations. And there are other parts that feels like, boy, that just crumbled and it's turned to mud again. And that's okay because God can take that and build it back into brick, build it back into the vessel that he needs it to be. And so that there, there's something that's moldable about your life still. And there's something that was moldable, uh, adaptable from the tell. And of course, uh, and this might have been the most important reason they built on the tell, is that it was the best uh, defense in the ancient world to have an elevated location. Uh, to raise the height of a city as much as possible and... So often, uh, there would be no elevated site in the, in the plains of the Middle East. Or, or it'd be so difficult to even access a higher place. But those earlier layers, they added so much weight that then the next layers that got built on them, this became a very sturdy place, and it would be a high and lifted up. And because of that elevated, elevated site, these things are possible for the city. One, it's much more strategically positioned to be protected from enemy onslaught. And secondly, it was, it was a much more wonderful and beautiful vista from which to see life. The city will be rebuilt on our ruins. And, and, and you've been through things. I've been through things. We've all been through things in this world. And, and I think what God would want to say is how you can live from now on, how you can live positively, hopefully, from this moment on, instead of being relegated to the, to the past, and instead start living this day from now on as if you hadn't had troubles, and start realizing that God can elevate you to a new place, like a city that's been rebuilt on the mound of ruins, so that you will be in a strategic place new advantage in the spiritual battle. Yeah, you've learned some things over the years. And God's teaching you some things now. Some of the mistakes that I've made, some of the, the tragedies I've faced, some of the rubble of the past, you know what? I realize now it's just served to build up the foundation to where I don't, I don't, I don't fall for some of the same tactics of the devil that I might have years ago before some of the rubble. Don't, don't look back over your past and wallow in your mistakes. Realize that God's built up a new, a new place for your city to be rebuilt where you've got a strategic advantage. And there, there are ways the enemy can't get to you now because you're in a new elevated place. And it also means that through the lens of God's grace, you can see what you didn't see before. You can see beauty where you didn't see it. You can see further than you did before. You're less likely to fall, and you're more likely to see the expanse of God's grandeur. There was one more thing. I saw the website about why people built it tells, and this, this makes sense. The owners of the ruined houses and their families that were their heirs, they had claim to the property. And so it made sense that they could return to their own property and rebuild it. So all said, the property, though in ruins, still belonged to the prior inhabitants. If you own a piece of property and a storm knocks it down, you might have rubble, but you still have the property. It's still yours. Maybe that's the most beautiful thing of all, is that you've got a claim spiritually, over this life that God's given to you. And He came in the person of Christ to restore dominion and, and authority. And maybe God's calling you. It's time to, to reclaim it. God's a restorer. You can count on it. 
You can count on the fact that this is the nature of God because in the first place, this is how God defines Himself. Look at Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, this is God defining himself for us, okay? Says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited and the cities and of the cities of Judah, they shall be rebuilt and I will raise up their ruins. He's defining himself. God's telling you who he is, Isaiah 61.4. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. Joel 2, verse 25, famously, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. I will restore. You know, over and over, you just scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture, God is defining himself, saying, this is my nature. It is my nature, says the Lord, to restore. It's not my nature, the Lord says, to abandon something and just let it be forgotten or annihilated. It is the nature of God to restore what has been broken, what has been crushed, what has been left for ruins. God loves to restore. And he's proven himself over and over. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, and he had warned them that disobedience meant death. He didn't annihilate Adam and Eve, did he? No, there was a spiritual death that came to them, but immediately God offered the first real blood sacrifice by killing an animal in order to take animal skins into leather garments to cover them and cover their shame. And from that moment on, he made a plan of restoration of Adam. And Jesus, we don't have time to talk about this, but Jesus came, the Bible says, as a second Adam. His plan was not to annihilate humanity, but to restore. When the people of God were in their slavery in Egypt and they cried out to God, God didn't just leave them in their slavery. He wants to restore their freedom. He didn't ever intend to leave the Israelites in Babylon when they were exiled there by Nebuchadnezzar. He always intended to restore them. That's what Jeremiah's prophecy is about. And God's not going to scrap you. He won't, he won't, he won't annihilate you. you. You will one day leave this earth and God will take the very dust from which we were made in the beginning and He'll remake you. But it'll be your self-same body. He will glorify your body. Just, just this weekend, holding the hand of one of my uh, dearest, dearest friends, Bill, who went to his, his glory. And you, if you ever experienced that holy, holy uh, time of watching someone transition to, to heaven, you, you realize breath is fleeting. And we either going to believe, well, that's it, we're annihilated and it's over, or there is a God who says there's so much value on your life and who you are that I am absolutely committed to make you new. And when you go to heaven one day in a glorified body, it's the ultimate fulfillment of Jeremiah 30, 18. I will rebuild the city on top of her ruins. I'll make glorious. You, you can count on this because God's Nature is such to be a restorer. He's proven himself over and over to be a restorer. And I want you to see that you can count on it because of the compassion of God. Notice again in verse 18, this is what the Lord says, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and I will have compassion on his dwellings. He's compassionate. In the next chapter in Jeremiah 31, 9, with weeping they shall come and with pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. 
I wish I had time to talk to you about this as we've been speaking some about the mysterious blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim was the younger of Joseph's sons, but Jacob crossed his arms and took the strong right hand, the symbol of blessing that should have been reserved for the firstborn Manasseh, and instead extended it to the head of Ephraim as a picture of the grace of God that would come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. But here is Jeremiah prophesying the word of the Lord. I'm a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. The one who didn't deserve blessing has received my blessing, and I have, the Lord says, adopted you. This is why we bless everyone to be as Ephraim and Manasseh. This is why it's the most important Old Testament family blessing that exists, because to say, may God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh is to say, may you receive the blessing that you didn't deserve, and may you know yourself to be adopted as an heir of God. This is the nature of God. He's a father who has heirs, and he cannot abandon them because of the compassion that he has. His compassion is pictured maternally in Isaiah 49, 15. God is a father, but he has, he has no gender. And he has expressed in his being also the maternal. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. God's saying, if you've ever watched a mother and her baby you know that there's just no way just something happens in the love attachment of the mother and the baby, something organically, biologically that's taking place. She can't forget her baby. She can't just go, oh, wait a minute, I hear my baby crying. I uh, wonder what that's about. She, she, her, her whole being is designed to be able to feed that baby, to nurture that baby. She cannot, she cannot forget the baby. She, to, to, compassion is woven into her being, God is saying. He's saying there's something about God that's like that. He said in verse 16, Behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your city is before me all the time. So when Jesus came, what did we see in Jesus? Yes, he healed people because it brought glory and signs and wonders, but he mainly healed people because he loved them. Matthew 9, 36 said, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'm saying God is full of compassion. He's just spilling over with compassion for you. And this is why he restores. I think any parent has ever had a child who, who, who had something that broke. You immediately know what it feels like. I just, I, I'd like, I want to help glue it back together for you. I, I, I want to, I want to restore it for you. I want you to be able to, to have it. That's what compassion does. But let me say, there's another reason you can be absolutely assured of God's commitment to restore you and restore your world, and that is His own glory is at stake. There's a very interesting verse that precedes our text today. Verse 17. For I will restore health to you, and your wounds I will heal, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast. It is Zion for whom no one cares. What is this saying? What it is saying is that other nations, pagan people, unbelievers, have looked at the exiles, and they have said, you're outcasts. <laughs> Nobody cares about this people. And the Lord is saying here in verse 17, I'm going to restore you if for no other reason nobody's going to tell my people that they're outcasts. They're not outcasts. They're going through a momentary discipline and I'm going to bring them back. Nobody's going to speak this way about my people. You know, it's kind of like as a parent, you're like, you, you might have to discipline your own children and that's all well and good, but somebody else starts speaking negatively about your children. like, huh <laughs> no, no, no. It's one thing for me to correct him, but it's not for you to correct him. And God is saying, I I'm committed to showing myself glorious, and he's going to bring his people back. God has too much invested in you to let your life lay in ruin. He's going to rebuild. So, look around. Where do you got some ruins? Start thinking about it differently. 
those ruins are good building blocks for what's next in your life. This uh, book I've just written, The Power to Bless, I open it telling openly and openly telling that, you know, I had so I had so many advantages as a child. So I'm a mo- the greatest mother in the world and wonderful brothers, and I, I had so so many wonderful gifts in my life. But my dad left home when I was in the fourth grade, and 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 he wasn't around to to bless my life. And and. And I wanted, I, I, I yearned to have a dad that would be there to speak out a positive vision and faith over my life and destiny. And, and, and I missed that. But you know what? Out of that part of the rubble of my life, guess what? <laughs> out of that yearning to crave that blessing. I went on a pursuit of blessing. I came to understand blessing and and I, I came to find spiritual fathers in my life and I came to receive blessing and and from my heavenly father and I came to learn about the power to bless so that I could raise my own children in blessing and to learn to be a preacher who just blesses your life and just speaks that over your life and now God's given me the honor to write a, a book on the subject so out of the rubble came a tell and I got to go up on top of it and now able to see and 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 announce in a new way and I'm able to have advantage over the enemy in a new way because of what I'd experienced if I if I had if I had not experienced the pain of the brokenness of that relationship with my father and not miss if I hadn't had that yearning if I hadn't had that ruins in my life then then I, I, I would never have been talking to you about blessing right now or writing a book about it or helping anybody else. Well, what in your life do you consider ruins? Look at it and ask the Lord to take it and build a tell out of it and say, Lord, I'll take you up on your promise to, to rebuild. And then look to Jesus. Because if you understand God's commitment to restore out of the ruins, you need look no further than the cross where... He is lifted up in humiliation and exile on our behalf. Christ, our exile, who had to experience what it feels like to to have his father's face turned away, to experience what it's like to have the sin of the world literally put into him so that we who trust in him could become his righteous. You look no further than Jesus and you'll see how the ruins, the ruins of the cross, have become the salvation of the world. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and compassion on their dwellings. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. God is a master renovator and you are his restoration project. And that's the gospel.
Do you have some ruins in your life? Got some rubble in your past? It might be that you think, I need to get as far away from that as possible. I need some kind of do-over and just annihilate and scrap all of that. But I'm here to tell you today that the nature of God is to do the opposite. The nature of God is to take what looks like ruins and let it become the building blocks of a giant restoration project. (laughs) We're fixer-uppers. We're not going to be thrown away. We're not going to be scrapped. But we are being rebuilt, and one day we will be absolutely glorified. And I pray for you that God will give you increasing revelation about all the ways that He has been at work restoring you and plant in your heart the deepest hope, the hope of complete restoration. He is rebuilding now. So look and see, where is the tell? Where is the mound that's been built up to give you a new strategic advantage over the enemy and a new vista from which you can see all of life. If you've never said yes to the restoring power of Jesus, why not let today be the day to recognize that you're a sinner and that God came in the person of Jesus as the Savior, is to simply say that I cannot save myself and that in and of myself I'm utterly lost. But God, you came to restore, to restore a relationship between me and you. And you ask Jesus to come in your heart by faith and say, I will trust and follow you. And when you do, you become an adopted child of God, one who is engraved on the palms of his hand, one who will never, ever, ever be separated from God. Ask him today to be your Lord and Savior. And may the Lord God bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen.